A Patriot's History of the United States, Chapter 16, Part 3, Labor and Leviathan. By that time, however, the Democratic Party realized that it had struck gold in the votes of the labor unions, which it courted even more intensively after 1934, when the midterm elections gave the Democrats an even larger majority. The new House had 322 Democrats to only 103 Republicans and fewer than a dozen third and fourth party representatives. The Democrats held more than a two-thirds majority in the Senate as well. It was the closest a single party had come to dominating the government since the Southern Democrats had walked out during secession. Traditional Democratic supporters, such as the unions, saw their opportunity to seize power on a more or less permanent basis. And even the split of the unions in 1935, when John L. Lewis left the older, more established American Federation of Labor, did not damage the Democrats' support with organized labor. Lewis's new union, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, CIO, drew together industrial unions like the United Mine Workers, the ladies' garment workers, and the amalgamated clothing workers. In 1934, however, the unions overplayed their hand. A series of violent strikes, many of them initiated by radical elements, resulted in a wave of looting, burning, and general rioting in New York, Philadelphia, and Milwaukee. That was even before the textile workers began a strike of monstrous proportions slamming shut factory gates in 20 states and setting off armed conflicts when police and troops battled strikers. Roosevelt conveniently was out of the country at the time, arriving home with his characteristic good fortune after the strike had ended. If anything, labor unrest only encouraged the more radical elements of the Democratic Party to press for more extreme demands within their new majority. Many viewed the period after the 1934 elections as a chance to entrench programs that only a decade earlier might have seemed unattainable, locking their party into power for the foreseeable future. Harry Hopkins sensed the critical timing, declaring desperately, we've got to get everything we want, a works program, social security, wages and hours, everything, now or never. Securing the loyalty of the labor unions was crucial to establishing the Democrats permanently as the majority party. Thus, the new Congress passed the National Labor Relations Act, known for its author, Robert Wagner of New York, as the Wagner Act, which protected the right to organize unions and prohibited firing union activists. More important, perhaps, Congress established the National Labor Relations Board, NLRB, to bring management and labor together, at least in theory. In practical terms, however, management had to bargain in good faith, meaning that any time the NLRB decided management was not acting in good faith, it could impose sanctions. The Wagner Act thus threw the entire weight of government behind the unions, a 180-degree turn from the government's position in the late 1800s. Similar pro-labor legislation involved the Fair Labor Standards Act, which established a minimum wage. With the legislators' focus on raising the wages of employees, especially male family heads, little attention was directed at the natural business reaction, which was to trim workforces. More than any other single policy, the minimum wage law cemented unemployment levels that were nearly twice those of 1929, ensuring that many Americans who wanted jobs could not accept any wage offered by industry, but could only work for approved government wages. After the law, in order to pay minimum wage to a workforce that had previously consisted of 10 employees, the employer now could only retain eight. The problem was that no set wage level creates wealth. It only reflects it. Employment recovery represented the industrial side of job relief, whereas raising income in the agricultural sector was the aim of the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, AAA, 
which sought to drive up prices by restricting farm output. Aimed at addressing the central problem of agriculture in the 1920s, overproduction, which had resulted in lower prices, the AAA subsidized farmers not to produce, that is, to restrict production. In one summer, southern farmers received funds to plow up to 10 million acres of cotton, and Midwestern farmers were paid to eliminate 9 million pounds of pork, all at a time when unemployed starving people stood in soup lines. Farm income indeed rose, but only because farmers took the government subsidies and kept their production levels up, occasionally double planting on the remaining acreage. Large corporate producers did well in the new system, receiving substantial government checks with a large sugar company receiving more than $1 million not to produce sugar. But the farm programs worked in favor of the Democrats, adding to the Roosevelt Coalition. Even after the Supreme Court declared the AAA unconstitutional, the administration shuffled the subsidies off to existing soil conservation programs, where in one form or another they remained until the 1990s when Congress finally eliminated most of them. Still, other parts of the 100 Days incorporated more direct state planning, such as the Tennessee Valley Authority, TVA Act, which authorized public money for multi-purpose dams to generate power for rural areas. The authority would build a 650-mile canal from Knoxville, Tennessee to Paducah, Kentucky, and marked a further insinuation of government into private markets. Although most of the recovery efforts could be and were justified as necessary to pull the nation out of the depression, it would be naive to ignore political implications of the measures, especially for the Democratic Party. With each new government initiative, reliance on the federal government grew, and the party that would promise to maintain or even expand government assistance could count on the votes of large numbers of Americans who saw the opportunity to tax others for their own benefit. Such was the case with the Homeowners Loan Act of June 1933, in which the government guaranteed home loans. This legislation had the effect of benefiting new home buyers by making it less risky for a lender to extend credit. But it created a new quasi-dependent class of people, who assumed it was the government's responsibility to guarantee that everyone could own a home. Supporters of this type were expanded under the similar Federal Housing Administration, FHA. And after World War II, Veterans Administration, VA loans, all under the guise of making home ownership a right. All these acts carried the potentially fatal risk that at some point, a majority of Americans would see the path to prosperity as running through the government, essentially taking from their neighbors to pad their own pockets. And at that point, the game would be up. All politics would disintegrate into a contest of promising to dispense more goodies than the other fellow. When judged, even by short-term success, however, the New Deal must be considered a failure. Other nations saw industrial growth in the 1930s, including New Zealand, Japan, Greece, Romania, Chile, Denmark, Finland, and Sweden, but not the United States. Life expectancy, which had increased steadily for 16 years before Roosevelt, abruptly dropped by 1940, over a year before Americans went into World War II. And the gap in life expectancy between blacks and whites grew, The national debt had exploded, growing more in eight years of Roosevelt's rule than in the previous 150 years of the nation's existence. Average unemployment in 1939, after eight years of New Deal solutions, was higher than in 1931, before Roosevelt gained the presidency. Birth rates fell, but homicides rose. From 1900 to 1960, the annual national murder rate surpassed 10,000 only seven times, and all seven were on Roosevelt's watch. Divorce rates, suicide rates, 
syphilis cases, and arrests all increased during the New Deal years. Bums rode the railroads and train jumpers died at the highest levels ever from 1933 to 1936. Of course, income tax rates soared, production shut down, and there was a capital strike. As those few who had money hoarded it rather than let Roosevelt confiscate upward of three-fourths of their income. Worse, as Amity Shales notes, Roosevelt and his staff were becoming habitual bullies, pitting Americans against one another. Moreover, the New Deal caused a new influx of corporate money into politics, unlike anything seen before. What stands out is how little business gave to either political party prior to the Great Depression and the manipulation of the tax code that politicians wrought in an attempt to combat corporate donations. Corporate donors learned in 1936 that government had put itself in the position of picking winners and losers in the tax code, and for the first time, they needed to influence politicians with money on a regular basis. And we'll read the insert titled, The New Deal, Immediate Goals, Unintended Results, in the next video. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment below. Love to hear from you guys. Love you, as Tigger says. Ta-ta for now.